Thank you. Um, I wanted to start um, this panel discussion just by introducing my panelist um, to you today. And I wanted to take a, a moment just to do this before we have a little, just we're going to have a couple quick questions that I have for them to answer, and then we're going to open it up um, for discussion. Um, I realize you've been sitting already uh, for an hour and a half, and it takes a very special person uh, to continue to sit and listen to us talk um, for you know more than 15 minutes. But first, with the introductions, uh, to my right um, is Jennifer Gonzalez. Uh, she's an associate professor in the History of Art and Visual Culture Department at the University of South California at Santa Cruz. She holds a PhD from UCSC in the History of Consciousness, and she served as a teaching fellow for the prestigious independent study program at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. Dr. Gonzalez writes about contemporary art with an emphasis on installation art, digital art, and activist art. She is specifically interested in understanding the strategic use of space by contemporary artists and by cultural institutions such as museums. More specifically, she has focused on the representation of the human body and its relation to discourses of race and gender. Her book, Subject to Display, Reframing Race in Contemporary Installation Art was published by MIT Press in 2008. And I have to say that Subject to Display is a required reading on almost every syllabus that I design. Um, and Dr. Gonzalez in this book examines the work of contemporary artists who use installation art as a way to stage a critical assessment of race politics um, in the United States. In addition to installation art, Dr. Gonzalez has also published a recent monograph on Pepon Osorio. Um, and is currently at work on a, a new project that deals with issues of democracy and capitalism in contemporary art. To my left is Lewis Watts. Lewis Watts is a photographer, archivist, curator, and associate professor of art at the University of California at Santa Cruz. His research and artwork centers primarily on cultural landscape, focusing on African-American communities in Oakland, Richmond, San Francisco, New Orleans, and Harlem. He has been teaching photography at UCSC and UC Berkeley since 1978. Professor Watts' work has been exhibited in many national and international venues, which I'm going to just sort of toot his horn here, um, at the de Young Museum, the Tisch School of the Arts at New York University, the African American Museum in Philadelphia, the Frist Center for the Visual Arts in my hometown of Nashville, Tennessee, and the Zokai Gallery and University Museum in Tokyo. His work is also in several public collections, including the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and the Smithsonian Institution. He's also the co-author of two books, Harlem of the West, the San Francisco Fillmore Jazz Era, which was published in 2006, and most recently, New Orleans Suite, published by UC Press in 2013. I hope that if you haven't had the chance already that you'll go across the street um, for his current exhibition of photographs at the UC Berkeley Extension Center Art Gallery, which is on view um, until next month, June 13th. Right? So please help me welcome our panelists. So as I said, I just wanted to start off with kind of a couple of really broad questions that I'm going to throw with little softballs um, <laughs> to my panelists. And the first one I wanted to ask to, to Jennifer, given her expertise and interest in sort of institutional politics and their effects on discourses of art, I wanted to ask, um, you know, actually thinking about what we saw in the film in particular, you know, to what degree do you think um, the lack of an institutional presence for Jean-Michel Basquiat's work, we heard that you know, he was refused by collectors um, at the Whitney and at MoMA. How do you think that this sort of has impacted his critical legibility, if at all? It's such a, it's such a wonderful question. And uh, uh, while I was watching the film, I was thinking about all the ways in which these uh, white curators and white collectors and white girlfriends and various other people that were surrounding Basquiat um, sort of unconsciously and completely unselfconsciously talked about the way he might be perceived as a thief um, or that uh, you know everyone wanted a piece of him um, and how you know then the press starts to take up this set of questions about the, the body in the basement and so forth and I was just thinking about even in the retelling of his life by the people who surrounded him that his racialized status was still operative in a lot of what they were doing with him after the fact. And I take that as a kind of symptom of what happens also in discourses in the art world and institutions in the art world, museums in the art world, 
and publications in the art world and the fact that um, in a way we saw the collector and I'm going to forget which collector it was but it was the woman who was saying you know when I see something that disturbs me I know maybe it's going to be a, something interesting or good she was the curator at MoMA, right? Tim That's Yeah, Timkin, right. And I was thinking about the way that um, when Basquiat was coming out, it was before the infamous 1993 Whitney Biennial in which a lot of artists of color and U.S. artists, um, Latino artists, African-American artists, got a kind of visibility in a large-scale exhibition that was roundly critiqued by the white mainstream press for being too political and being too ethnic and being too all kinds of things we can imagine labels they might have applied in, in 1993. But that was only five years after Basquiat died. And there was a kind of there was a kind of way in which Basquiat was truly alone in a space of hostility in that historical moment. And it's not to say that there isn't still hostility, and those institutions aren't doing the same things today. There have been some changes. And institutions like this that have been established that didn't exist before, or fewer existed, and there were fewer and farther between. So when you think about an artist like that producing work that has many layers of complexity, I love the fact that he said Robert Ferris Thompson was the one who kind of understood his work because he was reading Robert Ferris Thompson's work. And Robert Ferris Thompson, the kind of old man in the armchair, uh, who was uh, talking about his work, is someone who's done a lot of work on uh, African, particularly West African and Yoruba art practices. And I think influenced Basquiat's interest in the figure and figuration and forms of figuration. And Basquiat was clearly a, a avid reader, and he was uh, interested in the visual arts as well as the musical arts, and Giordano was saying when we were watching the film, isn't it interesting that the, all the visual artists that he, most of the visual artists in any case that he references are white, and the musical uh, ar artists he references are black. And I was thinking, yeah, but kind of what's interesting is that he's referencing these canonical white artists, but then he's also bringing in a whole sort of set of uh, African tr visual tropes that he's actually borrowing from scholars like Robert mm -hmm. Ferris Thompson or other people he's reading, he's sort of curious about, trying to find out about, thinking also about um, systems of uh, drawing and, f and forms of um, face making and mask making and, and some of these other trope, visual, let's call them tropes for now. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the points is that he wasn't very legible to the critical audience because he was making references to a variety of sources and only some of them were legible to that white mainstream critical audience. And as a result, much of the work wasn't, it, some of it was understood and some of it was just missed. A lot of it was just really misunderstood. I'll stop there, but I think we could say more about it. And I think the film gives us a sense of that, mm -hmm. you know, a bit. But I really, what I missed in the film was closer readings of the works. Mm -hmm. So the works are just supposed to, in a way, stand on their own. We get lots of great details of the works. Um, but we don't have anyone really parsing them out for us um, carefully. Mm -hmm. And I know your book is going to do that. So <laughs> congratulations. That was a pressure. Yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah. No, I think that's true. I think it's a really apt um, observation that there is kind of this, this impulse in the work to kind of quickly identify, right? Like, oh, this says man dies, or oh, this is from a particular book. So I think that's, an, that's a common impulse with the work. So absolutely. To, oh, can I just say one more thing? Of course. I wanted to raise one question that no one really seems to be addressing explicitly, but that the work addresses really explicitly, and hence I'm thinking a lot about capital right now, is that the work is a lot about capitalism, mm -hmm. right? And which is obvious in sort of references to oil companies and so forth. But you'll notice the use of the copyright symbol a great deal, right? And the, and the trademark. And, and just thinking about the ways that that kind of mark making is a critical engagement with ownership and who is owned by whom. And you can see Basquiat seeing like all these layers mm -hmm. of power and ownership uh, operating in the work. And I think that's, um, that's something that interestingly um, maybe put some of those rich collectors ill at ease, mm -hmm. right? Maybe mm -hmm. it was getting too political. Mm -hmm. Maybe that stuff with Warhol was pointing too expressly at the oil company, the, a certain kind of world of New York City that didn't want to be criticized. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's why it got such a negative kickback. Yeah. I mean, people don't really talk about that. Yeah. Okay, so that was my last little comment. 
Okay, so um, I know that, that Lou has graciously prepared a little presentation for us. That miraculously may work. We'll that might that. actually work, which is even better. Um, but, you know, I think in the film there's a lot of talk about, you know, sort of uh, Basquiat being sort of this like receptacle of all these influences, um, which I think is in many cases very true, um, that, he, that he is sort of, you know, taking from the masters of our history and all white, right, um, for, for reasons that we can discuss afterwards. Um, but I think it's interesting to see from a, a contemporary practicing artist today sort of how Basquiat then filters, right, into contemporary practice. Um, so I want to hand it over to Lou to, to talk a little bit about how he sees sort of the, the, the lasting impact of, of Basquiat, his aesthetic strategies and his work um, manifests um, in, in your own visual practice. Well, when the first, I was trying, thinking, I mean, it's been interesting, the last couple of weeks I've been thinking about him, and I remember kind of when he came into my consciousness, and I was interested because he was somebody getting over, I mean, uh, this guy who, uh, I sort of remember going to New York when sort of graffiti, there was this beautiful graffiti on the subway that was just incredible, sort of before people started doing their initials. And I sort of remember that tradition, and then realizing here are some people all of a sudden who are sort of crossing over into the mainstream. And it's not an accident that a lot of the soundtrack of this movie and a number of others is bebop. You talked about that being his favorite music, and that music was sort of where he really referenced kind of black influences. Um, so I was thinking about um, I, that um, he had a studio on Great Jones, and so did Charles Mingus. And there's a whole thing of Charles Mingus being kicked out of his studio. I don't know if it was that one or not. But there's sort of certainly parallels. And I was saying to Jennifer, on some level, he hit his sophomore slump. I mean, all of a sudden, he was not the flavor of the month. And unfortunately, um, he, you know, he uh, probably had a, you know, a bad, it could have even been an accident, but he sort of used drugs as a way to kind of uh, uh, numb himself. And that, that was unfortunate, because I have a feeling, especially because you said, like, the, what happened with the Wendy Biennial is that all of a sudden, there was sort of currency. Um, so what I'm going to do is sort of quickly um, do this, this is one of the fastest slideshows I've ever put together. But I was going to talk a little bit about my work and sort of what I, what I think what I really, what resonated me with me after the, sort of the initial just fascination was that here was someone, like a lot of other artists, mostly musicians, but other people, who kind of used a set of um, influences and, and observations and kind of riffed on them. You can see it all over his work. I mean, he, he did it with words, he did it with images. And I was thinking about, um, or he, he does a whole piece about ornithology and Thelonious Monk kind of sort of doing these things where he's doing the scales and all of a sudden he's kind of riffing around and Charles Parker. And so all of that as a model was really kind of something parallel. So I am a photographer, I don't paint, um, but I'm gonna sort of show, show a few images that I think are my observations of some of those um, phenomena. This is actually an a picture I did. Uh, I did a book with Walter Hood, who teaches, uh, uh, land who's a landscape architect, uh, called uh, Jazz and Blues Improvisations. And we were, we were sort of looking at West Oakland and how in West Oakland, um, people are improvise and with the materials that they have. So this is actually kind of a photograph that's really important to me. Um, uh, Walker Evans is one of my favorite photographers. And he, he used signage as a kind of reflection of um, the kind of what was happening in the world. And it's funny, I took this picture and then I remember a couple days later trying to find it again and it disappeared. And when I had a, this is in West Oakland. And the sign actually came down not too long after I took it. Um, and this is Joe's installation in Garvey Park where he made this uh, incredible sort of collective game out of found objects. And then these kids uh, uh, on Martin Luther King Way uh, using the Safeway basket as a uh, basket, and also you see them flying, if you look at the silhouette. And um, this is the cover of the book, Harlem of the West, and um, there's a picture with um, John Handy, who's still with us, and on the, other, on the far right is Frank Fisher, who's still with us, and then a young John Coltrane. In fact, I gave a copy of this book to Alice Coltrane, and she said this was the youngest photograph he, he'd, she'd ever seen of him, and then Pointy Poindexter, and kind of this, the idea of, of I found this cache of photographs of at, at, when I first came to San Francisco, it was just the black neighborhood in San Francisco. I didn't really know the history, but I knew that, and I got a chance to go to it in 64 uh, when I first came, and then by the end of the 60s, it disappeared. 
Um, and another place that I photograph um, is in Harlem, and I called this picture Ghost in Harlem, um, this idea that in New York things are a little older and the sort of silhouette of kind of what's preceded is usually in, in Boston, the landscape. And then the fact that um, I, I lived there for three months and every day I'd go out and there'd be some incredible thing happening in front of me um, that sometimes I would photograph. And also the fact that in, in 2008 when I was there, um, it was the hottest real estate um, uh, market in Manhattan and it kind of stopped right in the middle. And I saw these guys that were dressed like Black Panthers and I said, well, I have to photograph them. And as I raised the camera to my uh, head, they parted and the mother and, and daughter who lived in the stoop in, on Linux uh, were going home. I've had some friends accuse me of setting this picture up. And the African American parade, um, some people said Harlem is gone, but people were uh, lined up four deep for 40 blocks. And this is taken on 145th Street. And if you look closely, you see there are reflections that are stars in the street. Can't make this stuff up. Um, and I noticed this sign that I knew was familiar, and it turned out it was a recently uncovered sign that was Jane Vanderzee's last studio, which was around the block from where I was staying. And um, I thought it was interesting. There's a photograph that James Vanderzee, who was discovered in the Harlem on my mind um, exhibit, he, he had had a studio in the 20s and kind of was uh, not really known uh, nationally, and kind of after that, sort of had a really sort of prolific um, career, and it's interesting to me that he would photograph Basquiat, that Basquiat was sort of aware that that tradition and the connection, because there was a lot of things about him being isolated from his community, but he was not completely. And this is uh, New Orleans of the Suite. Should, this should be down in the store. I think it has in the past, so uh, if you're interested in it, in the lobby. Um, this is a... a um, uh, voodoo uh, altar, and I thought it was interesting that voodoo, like Santeria in Cuba, as, as a kind of amalgamation of a lot of different influences. In this case, there's a picture of Marie Laveau, uh, there's a picture of the Virgin Mary, there's some um, a Haitian fabric, there's a statue of Buddha, and that's how um, kind of belief was uh, amalgamated in the New World. This is a statue, a kind of mannequin of Ernie Cato who had a hit uh, mother-in-law. This is in front of the mother-in-law lounge. He died before the storm, but the, the sort of rumor going around New Orleans was that he was that this mannequin was lost after the storm. Um, I was able to, uh, I've been photographing there since 1994, and after the storm I was in a couple of exhibits and met some New Orleans, uh, photographers from New Orleans who were complaining about um, artists who, uh, photographers who came and sort of made books after the storm and left, but seemed to like my work, so it gave me access to sort of uh, cultural workers who were trying to make sure that the culture would not be set, uh, made in, like Disneyland in the French Quarter. Um, this is in the compound of um, the, uh, what are they, I'm not going to remember, but it'll come back to me, it's in the book. This is uh, David Montana, who and his aunt, who was one of the New Orleans um, Indians, and you know about that, don't know about that tradition, you should look. This is um, Alton Harris, who is a historian who go every year makes reference to the past uh, on Mardi Gras Day. So I wanted to go to Cuba because there's a connection between the aesthetics of Mardi Gras and Cuba and Haiti. And this is uh, St. Lazaro in old um, Havana. This is a, a kind of updated version of Cuban culture. I was interested in kind of, the exhibit's called Cuban Cambio, and it's changing by the minute. This is filming a, a, a novella, a soap opera in central Havana. This is, uh, so there's some pictures that are not in the exhibit. This is actually the set of a horror movie called Juan de los Muertos, which was a send-up and actually a big hit in, in Havana, and one of the first movies that was able to sort of satire Castro and the government, they satire everybody else. Um, pretty amazing. But I was just walking in the Melicone and came upon this and I went, what is this? Ferry from Ritla, which is the sister city of Richmond where I live, going back to Havana. Santiago de Cuba. Uh, there is television in Cuba, but there's also life on the street. Cent uh, uh, Quincenera in Santiago. This is Benny Billy, who was the voice of Benny Murray. Everybody said he was a good, he was a really nice guy until he got some notoriety. But here he is at home. This 
This is my um, uh, Hemingway reference. I had to photograph him. And so I was asking, is this Brujo or uh, Loco? And most people thought it was Loco. <laughs> Santeria, in, uh, uh, this was a festival of uh, St. Bartholomew. So the, there's not a lot of advertising, although there's going to be more, but there's a lot of images of Che, many, many more than Fidel. Here's a Che tattoo. This is Carnival in Santiago. These are art students. There's no, there are few women in the, the selection in the gallery. That was an oversight, because the, all the Cubans are incredibly beautiful. This is a uh, Santeria observation uh, in um, central Havana. This, this uh, goat was pretty calm, and during the time I was there, he was still living, so that's all I can say. This was the 50th anniversary in July of the revolution, and here's Raul giving a speech, and everybody was joking in this house that they were lucky because it's only 45 minutes, because Fidel used to talk for three or four hours. So the, I also then, I will do this very quickly, but I was thinking about Romare Bearden and kind of the parallels, you, you know what I'm talking about, um, in terms of that idea of you, he was looking for a form to sort of match the civil rights movement and use collage, and I think you can certainly say that that, in, that sort of gesture is very, it has parallels to Charlie Parker and Basquiat and a number of other artists that I like. I love this idea, if you're walking down a, a, a um, street in Harlem, you literally hear music of different kinds coming from different windows, and he captured that visually. It's really, this is... So, I think there's a connection there, and if you know what it is, you can let me know, but thank you very Or you much. can yes. just read my book, yes. where I okay. talk Was about it, oh, Bearden good. and Basquiat yeah, quite extensively. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Great. I kept feeling yeah. you might be. No, yeah, but thank you very okay. much for that. I think that's, that's really excellent. I wanted to... Um, Open it up to the the audience and, and see if you had any questions or comments or things that maybe you wanted to raise about the film or Basquiat's work. I could talk at you all day long about this, but I want to, you to guide the conversation. Brave souls. I can just make up questions we I typically get about Basquiat. I was going to say, you know, I, the, the, the movie that Julian Schnabel made of Basquiat with Jeffrey Wright, that was the first time that made Jeffrey Wright a star. And I think Jeffrey Wright's an incredible actor. But the footage, there's the footage that they referred to, I remember see, go, looking, seeking that out. And Basquiat made, he was so charismatic that it was, I, it sort of was a, it showed what a good actor Jeffrey Wright was, but he couldn't touch the charisma that um, Basquiat actually had himself. I mean, it's sort of interesting He's, that, that he has a personality was very hard to catch, and I don't know anybody who could have come as close as Jeffrey Wright did. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. You had a question? Yeah, um, because I haven't read your book yet, uh, but also because what we saw on the screen and with the work, can you talk a little bit about the polylingual, multilingual aspect so, of Basquiat's work? We know his mother was Spanish-speaking and his father was French-speaking and Creole-speaking, and then he also spoke English, and. Can you say something about how that was an important aspect of the work? Yeah, I think you know. Um, I think you were mentioning that you know some of the works are titled in Spanish, and you know there's a there's a there's some skepticism around whether he's titling them or they're being titled after right he's made them, and there's a lot of confusion around him actually. Um, as you can imagine, he made a thousand paintings um, in about seven years. Um, so there's not a lot of documentation. So some of the titles are a little bit wonky. Um, and some of them on the back have you know, five or six different titles. Um, so that particular case, I don't know if he actually titled in Spanish. But the sort of answer to your question is that, yes, he was sort of multilingual. And this idea of speaking in multiple languages, um, he was very aware of audience. Right, so an example that I always remember is that you know he would bring um, people would come to the loft and want to buy paintings, right? Um, and you know there was this one encounter that he had um, with a friend who brought some potential buyers, um, and the friend asked, you know, oh, you know, how much for this one, right? And he very quickly says like para tu or para ella, 
right? So, you know, for you or for her, right? So it was, you know, this way of really kind of slipping between communities, right, very quickly. Um, I can also say that, you know, he's interested in sort of the concept of language and its ability to, to change and, and, and sort of signify multiple things at once. So one of the examples you saw um, on the screen that I actually talk about in the book is there's a, a large canvas where he has this called um, the history of black people. Um, and he has that sort of large ship across the, the thing and he has the two masks on one side and on the, on the right side he has this little um, sort of vignette where he has the word Memphis, right? And it's sort of in a box and then above it he has Thebes, right? Referring to like Memphis of ancient Egypt. Um, and then below it he has Tennessee, yeah. right? So he's interested in the ability of sort of a word like Memphis to sort of multiply signify right, um, Egypt and the Americas, the sort of, sort of transition between the two, right? right? Um, so yes, there's a, there's a deep interest in, in language and sort of its ability to, to sort of change um, and, and to sort of permeate a variety of different meanings um, and to really sort of call upon these different audiences. He would often use particular words in Spanish and French and Creole as a way to sort of drop hints to very specific audiences, right? And, Another example I have that we saw in the film is um, Toussaint L'Ouverture, right, which is a, sort of a, a very big figure in Haitian history, right, leading the revolution. Um, but you notice that he sort of misspells it, right? So it literally becomes overture, right, like the, mus the musical reference. So there's a lot of play um, with language and its ability to sort of, you know, um, shift between meanings. Yeah, absolutely. I thought he used, he also used words Kind of very graphically, like and, and as images. I mean, I think that idea, mm -hmm. the kind of literal meaning of the kind of his drawings and the words were always kind of in. Mm -hmm. They were kind of having this interesting dialogue. I, I it was yeah. well, I you know I don't know if he titled all of them, but I it was really clear to me that kind of he really was a wordsmith and and someone who really tripped on yeah. on language. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting point. The fact that sort of people who have multilingual backgrounds have a certain way of negotiating, you know, that, mm -hmm. that I think was applied to him, which is Yeah, pretty, and pretty I, I think that the example they brought up of, of Burroughs using a visual technique for, right, right. his, his exactly. linguistic yes, practice yes, yes. is a very apt one, and yes. you're right. I mean, there's, there are examples that we have of faces where instead of actually drawing the mouths, he writes teeth, mm -hmm. right, or he draws a figure but writes feet, where the, we would expect the picture of the feet to be, right? So yeah, there's an, always a constant play between language and image there. I didn't show, or I spared you, but I actually just a couple of days ago saw some paintings by Miles Davis. And I think, I know Miles Davis was, was, had his eye on a lot of people, but there's a definite reference to um, Basquiat's work. It's kind of enigmatic, and it would be also what you'd expect a jazz player to do, that you can sort of see the references. So I think it's interesting that um, in many ways the kind of form, regardless of what you're sort of field is uh, that we, we borrow from each other in terms mm -hmm. of that idea of the collaging or of jazz being a variation of theme and you sort of start playing um, Loverman and all of a sudden it becomes something else based on the same tonal structure and I think he used kind of words and puns in very similar ways. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, do you have a question? Thank you, yeah, this is... Uh, Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so, my question is actually, I, there's so many things that come up just for me, you know, just like, I literally have like a, like a guttural feeling like thinking about Jean-Michel Basquiat, and so there's a lot of things. One thing though, that, that's an actual concrete question that I have is uh, about his mother. Um, there's not too much talk about his mother. I'm not, I'm not sure if she was living through all of the time. You know, I'm just curious, and also because they said she was in, a, in and out of mental health facilities, and the reason that comes to mind also was like little interesting things like when um, after was it the car accident when uh, when he got the spleen thing mm -hmm. and, and then she gave him a book the uh, Grey's Anatomy mm -hmm. and I just and I also think about the fine line between um, genius and insanity and I'll put that in quotes and so just really the conversation about his mother and also genius. Hmm. In the novel film, I know there's a kind of a couple of repeating scenes where he goes to the. Institution where she is and can't and can't get in or something. I, I sort of vaguely. I was, yeah, in the in the fi the fictionalized. fictionalized yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, well, I I think I mean I'll answer that question. I guess. Um, so his relationship with his mother um, was was complicated by the fact that his parents were divorced at a young age, um, and his father remarried um, when he was um, in his teens. And you know it it is 
I think you're right to sort of think about their early relationships where he, she gave him the Grey's Anatomy. He also mentions her influence. She was the one who took him to the Brooklyn Museum. Um, she was the one who sat down with him and had him draw pictures out of the Bible, right, um, to sort of start him on this path. Um, so he always sort of recognized there's a deep influence, and you see him refer to her in several chemists like Mater, right, um, which is you know, German um, for mother. Um, but they didn't have um, a very sort of close relationship. She's still alive. Um, they didn't have a very uh, close relationship. Um, after he was about 12 years old, um, he moved. He and his father moved briefly, and his two sisters, uh, to Puerto Rico, actually, where she's from, um, and lived there based on his work for about a year, year and a half. Um, but once he came back, there's not really a lot of contact. And I, I think it's mostly... Um, because of the separation of the relationship, you know, I think, you know, we frequently hear of, you know, uh, families where children are kind of expected to pick sides, right, in this case. And there were several attempts in his adult life um, to reach out and to connect with her, but I, I have no evidence that that actually happened. So. Yeah. Well, since you've... Um asked about the mother. I was curious about the father and the relationship with him because it, I was surprised to hear in the film that he came from a middle class background because he is so identified with the street and, and so it was a surprise. It seemed like he played with moving back and forth between wanting to go with the total street approach versus trying to gain the approval of his father and the approval of you know, the higher echelons of the art world. Yeah, um, I'll answer that one too, I guess. Crap. Should, yeah. um, so I, I think, you know, he was from a middle class background. Um, he, his father is an accountant. They said he played, you know, full, you know, blue blazer, brass buttons. Um, he, I think, you know, there's sort of a narrative that we have about Jean-Michel that I think in many ways satisfies our need for black artists to be untrained and rough and primitive. Um, and, right, and, and he really wasn't. I mean, he was very well-versed. I mean, he was going through the halls of the Met. Um, he was a member of the Brooklyn Museum, right? So he was very well-versed in art history, um, in art making. Um, he wasn't really a, a guy of the streets. And actually, I spend a lot of time um, in, in the book sort of dismantling some of those stereotypes we have about Jean-Michel as being, um, you know, they talk about him as being sort of this slave in the basement, and he actually quite nicely turns it around and says, yeah. if I were white, I'd be an artist in residence, right? right? Um, but really kind of turn on those stereotypes we have about you know, him being uh, a graffiti artist when actually he was not, right? A part of this movement, he was not accepted. He actually, there's a rumor that he was actually um, kidnapped and beaten up by a lot of graffiti artists um, for sort of um, posing right, as one of them without sort of um, getting involved in sort of all of those sort of um, mechanics, right, of, of hierarchies that, that occur um, with graffiti art in the late 70s. Um, so I think, you know, there, this sort of back and forth, I, I, I don't think that he was really confused. I think that he was actually um, caught between, um, you know, sort of this authentic life, right, where, you know, we're, he's living in the, the sort of market of the 80s, right, where it's all about capitalism, it's all about greed, it's all about consumption, and he was part of that, right, he's walking in Calme de Garçons, he's going to Dina de Luca, right, so he's caught in that moment, and this kind of need to, in my argument, kind of perform the primitive in order to be accepted, um, in a lot of these ways. So, you know, showing up at his openings and rags with like a Sambo hat, right? Um, so I think that it's, it's, a, it's a very sort of um, sophisticated um, sort of presentation of self um, that I think he recognized early on that he was, we only accept certain kinds of black artists in our discourses, right? Um, and I think he was very aware of that and, and sort of played into a lot of those stereotypes um, with the work, with the way he dressed, with the way he spoke, and with the histories about himself that he told, which were, for the most part, untrue. I also just wanted to comment on, we were nodding to each other in the middle of the film, how the people wanted to keep calling him Samo instead of Samo, and he had to keep correcting them, because of yeah. course Samo sounds a little bit Sambo. like Sambo. And so, you know, just, just, the, just the impossibility of signifying the way you want to signify in a simple 
condition like that because you have to always be correcting mm -hmm. or maybe you're you're hooking that way too yeah. an audience into a certain way right yeah. and then having to like make them aware of what they just said and yeah so i think yeah brilliant frankly and it was mr samo right mm -hmm. right he required right that he have a title right yeah. mr samo yeah that's absolutely right i don't remember if they say in this film but there's a lot of stories about him leaving mary boone right after his opening selling out the entire gallery right um and then not being able to hail a cab home right right um so he was very distinctly marked um as a black man in new york city at this moment so it's interesting. I saw, um, I, was, I wanted to say, I'm very happy to be with you, Jennifer, my colleague, who I see in places like Paris and here and never seen Santa Cruz. <laughs> uh, but when I, I was um, on, I don't want to name drop, but I was on Air France and saw a French produced movie about him that was incredible and had things I didn't know. Like the um, girlfriend went to medical school. She's actually a doctor now. And he went to Africa. Yeah, he went to Africa a couple of times with some African artists. Well, I've never What's heard, any other, uh, you probably know about that, but it's I, in all the movies, and actually in the books, the, uh, there's another biography of what, 10 years ago? I can't remember who wrote it. Mm -hmm. uh, there was never any reference to that. So I think he was a much more kind of nuanced character, and I, it was interesting. You sort of could see that in his eyes. I mean, you know, he was having to, all this stuff, the stuff he had, having to correct people and the, is exhausting. And I, you know, I think at a certain point, especially after Andy died, um, and that sort of the fact that that had not ended well, I think they really were estranged that, um, I, I love that I'm doing facts next to the biographer, so she can <laughs> kick me if I'm wrong. But I, 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 the, the thing I kind of recognize just when I see him, is like he was somebody I'd have a conversation with, and I, I, I know based on his sort of creative output that we would have some things to talk about. You know, even now, I mean, now he would be sort of closer to my age, but that, and you know, to say it was an accident is a tragedy, but it, it was, it's a, it was a reality that being sort of in the avant-garde in New York, which um, that maybe there's certain things you have access to that you wouldn't have in the Midwest. And if you don't do it right, you uh, don't wake up. And, and on some, like, I think that's, you know, Jimi Hendrix, you think of a lot of other people like that. Um, and so I think sometimes you can, if it was just an accident, I think it's a little bit different than it was so, you know, he was just so overwhelmed that he ended his life and I think the sort of I think the reality is somewhere in between and yes yeah I, I was sort of dismayed slightly by the comment that he was fragile mm -hmm. precisely because it seemed to dismiss the possibility that it was a deeply racist context yeah. that he was living and to put on to him the responsibility of his own failings mm -hmm. right Schnabel did that yeah Schnabel did that right yeah. like oh you know couldn't handle it was a lapdog et cetera, et cetera. right like oh, if only he had had the right kind of character, right. this would mm -hmm. have, right? It doesn't say anything about the fact that he was in deeply hostile territory right. day after day, right? In this day after day. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think that is something that isn't brought out. You know, yeah, and I, I think that's one thing that really spoke to me about that is there's, you know, as we've been talking, that he's always citing white artists, like always. It's mm -hmm. always, you know, de Kooning and Pollock and Picasso and Manet and Da Vinci, and, and it's never a black artist. And for the longest time, I thought like, what is up? Like, why is he not citing, you know, Bearden and Jacob Lawrence and all these other artists, Adrian Piper, David Hammonds, right, who are in New York in the 70s and really making work. And I think it's because, you know, he was actually called the black Picasso during his, left, during his lifetime, um, quite often in the press. And I think it was really because you know, he was so isolated. There was, there yeah. was, you know, to call him the Black Picasso, it wouldn't have made sense to say he was like Bearden because even Bearden didn't have the name, right, that in, in the 70s and 80s yeah. that he does now. There was no one that had that kind of success that was African American at that time. So he was extremely isolated. And I think that, you know, even he wasn't really aware of these artists that were working, right? The, the well, discourse we, was so overwhelmingly I mean, white. Yeah, that's why um, I was sort of really hard to see that picture that Van Der Zee did. I, I don't know if he was aware or not. I would say looking at his work that I think he was. Now, whether we heard, you know, we're kind of getting most of the information secondhand, even her footage, mm -hmm. in that we, uh, we don't know what he was saying when he was hanging out with his boys, because mm -hmm. we don't, that didn't get filmed. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, as like I said, I don't know, and I think this is a cautionary tale about well, what I was going to ask you about, do you think, say, if he had not gotten this immediate success, do you think he, he do you think it would have come eventually? I mean, it seems like he was an extraordinary artist. I mean, that's, the question is, 
he kind of was the, well, no, people saw that his work was good and I think they reacted to it. And then he had a couple of other things that made it, you know, he kind of had some, um, well, the, the kind of mythology, which I think sort of helped the publicity machine. But I think his work is, is incredible, extraordinary. And I, I don't think the, the sort of capitalists that bought his work would have done it if it, if, if it was just the flavor of the month. But I don't know, what, what do you think about that? I think that's impossible to answer. I mean, I think that it, he's he's such an interesting artist for me because he is such a good example of this the complete um, conflation of the art market and art history yeah. that happens in the 1980s and it's still happening today, right? So he was extremely successful in his lifetime, but received no real critical attention, received no real art historical attention, you know, no monograph before my book. Um, he's only been written about in exhibition catalogs, right? So. It, it is really difficult to say, and and I think that um, because of that, because of that sort of quick absorption into the art market right. that's still continuing, right? He's setting records still, yeah, forty-five yes, million. Yes, yes. Um, it is really precluded any serious consideration of him from an art historical standpoint because all of the work got absorbed into private collections and is not available for right. scholars, right? We can't go to the Smithsonian and look at the artist's papers, and we can't look at his notebooks and. There are works coming out of the attics, right, right, even now, so, yeah. Some of his friends are selling the things that he used to draw on the table cloths. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Let, 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 let me say just a couple of things about Basquiat, his uh, influence in particular. One is that uh, it would be impossible for a young African-American of his uh, intellect and interest, not to be well versed on the works of African American artists. Uh, he was a real seeker, and uh, it's clear that he had a lot of interest in a lot of stuff related to the sort of history of African American artists. Um, I think the omission comes from the standard way in which Eurocentrism works in the art artistic arena, and his was not the first uh, great career. There was an artist that preceded him uh, who also was the darling of the intelligentsia in New York City in the 1950s in the, and the early 60s, and his name was Robert Thompson. And Robert Thompson had a very similar career. It was huge, and then it collapsed in his overdose death. Um, he knew about that. Uh, also, I would say that in the 1980s, when he was invited to come to the Art Institute, uh, before his death, uh, he said that he would not come if they couldn't guarantee him that he would be able to meet Raymond Saunders. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you can see from the way in which his work progressed that Ray had a deep influence on his work. Ray not only worked at the same time with Rauschenberg and Johns and Cy Twombly and their influences and interactions um, became very clear to him and his mark making. And also Bearden and his relationship to the streets, I think inspired the pattern that he used to help articulate those doors mm -hmm. and the way in which those doors became a central theme in his work. Um, there was also a kind of reciprocal dialogue between Ray, Basquiat, and the doors. So this, this notion of a door and a doorway and the relationship of Basquiat to this really deep African-American history, I think, is really clear. The problem is that the Eurocentrism, which has been central in the uncovering of information about any artist, has sort of really turned away from those influences. And finally, I would say that the, it was interesting to see and to find uh, his concern about the cabs and his hailing a cab. 
rather uh, an interesting kind of metaphor for the museums, also like the cabs, uh, absolutely passed him by. Um, I remember and I collected a great deal of material on Basquiat, hundreds of articles and papers and magazines. And while his friends Snobble and, and uh, um, David Sally donned the covers of every magazine every other month throughout the 1980s, a Basquiat never appeared on those magazines, yet I have dozens of magazines from France and Germany that did extensive articles on him. So I guess he would be interested in hanging out in those other kind of places, given the nature of American, or particularly uh, America's relationship to the art world, or I should say black's relationship to that world. Anyway. I, great. I think we need to identify the speaker as being no, 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 no. Yes, yes, we do. <laughs> because he's I an incredible artist, but it. also he's from Arkansas, like somebody else up on the. Th I never told you that. <laughs> so, yeah, yes. Right. <laughs> Thank you. I, it, when he was, I think I was trying to get to that, but you said it much more articulately. Um, I wonder if someone could talk about the fact that he was an immigrant uh, and you and he's referred as uh, African-American, but actually, I know there's a difference between being a black from Puerto Rico and a black from Haiti. Mm -hmm. and, uh, may, and did he identify with the immigrant, uh, like the Boricanos in New York, or did he identify, you know, w w you seem to think he only identified with African-Americans? What do I think? Um, I think uh, I think it's complicated, and I think that you know there there are two kinds of ways I think that he identified. I think as the way in which he saw himself, um, and the way in which others saw him, right? So you know he could have very well felt that he was an immigrant and that he was Puerto Rican and Haitian, and he calls it out right in that biography drawing that you see. He says mother from Puerto Prince, or, sorry, right, and then. The, Sorry, father from Puerto Prince, mother from Puerto Rico, right? He answers all the questions right there. But I think that there is kind of this conflict happening um, where no matter how he attempts to define himself, he is always specifically located as this, right? As this category. And so I think that there's a way in which he has not allowed that complexity um, of identity in the larger world. But with the black Americans, would be considered, I mean, with the whites, any black is black. They don't make any difference. Mm -hmm. The black African Americans would be considered uh, immigrant, or you know what I mean, Puerto Rican, or not as far as I know. Um, you know, he it, most of his friends in this moment um, are, um, you know, Aldias, right? So he sort of, um, you know, uh, splits ways with him quite young, right? Um, once he reveals himself as Samo, Aldias leaves. Um, the friendship um, feels betrayed, um, and at that point, he's really hanging out um, with, you know, uh, Ram Al Z, um, Fab Five Freddy, um, you know, uh, Toxic A One. So there, there, there's it's a it's a mixed crowd. Um, but I know that you know he does talk a little bit about you know Fab Five Freddy taking him to like you know Black Panther meetings um, and things like this. So. You know, I'm I'm a historian, so it's very hard for me to kind of f like theorize about sort of his personal um, identification. I can only look at what he said, what he's made as a sort of clues into that. And it seems that he is very interested in the immigrant experience insofar as sort of this universal connection um, of people coming from Africa to the Americas. He's very interested in diasporas specifically. Um, and I think that might sort of go towards answering questions about sort of his identity. I think he very much saw himself as a product of this diaspora and this sort of crossing of the Atlantic. I'd like to respond too, though, just to say that um, I write about this Puerto Rican artist named Pepon Osorio, whose work uh, also has to do with being um, an immigrant, but also identifying with different kinds of Puerto Rican communities and racial 
hierarchies within the Puerto Rican community between black and white and various gradations of raciality and so forth uh, within the community in the United States, in its own, in its displaced space in the United States. And he also talks about how it's challenging as a Puerto Rican to manage or to work through the white, black, US kind of framework of race and race history, um, which he was coming to kind of as an outsider in the 1970s. And in a way, even though Basquiat was raised here, his parents were coming to that as outsiders uh, in the 1960s, right, when they were having their children. And so I think uh, it could be that Basquiat was was intelligently figuring out how to work the system, right? And figured, well, you want me to be that kind of black, fine, you know, I'll be that kind of black. Okay, you want me to be that kind of Puerto Rican? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll but I probably, he was conflicted, I would imagine, around just how he fit into the black American mm -hmm. yeah. scene. Puerto Ricans and Haiti, is he considered like one of their own? Haiti, Haiti, not so much. You know, I would say that you know, um, his father was was very eager to separate from Haiti, um, and and that's because the conditions under which he fled Haiti, right, and the Tonton Maku and, and, and Duvalier, right. So he came in the fifties, um, and and you know, I actually got in a fight with him once um, because I talked about you know I was going to publish this essay about his connections, Busquets' connections to Haiti, and you know, um, Vodou and all of these things, and and the father got on the phone and said, you know, he never even spoke Creole. He knew nothing about Haiti, right? We're French, yeah, we're French, and so I think there's there's a there's a conflict even from the right. point of the father, right, of of finding one's place within this history. But um, yeah, I think in Puerto Rico they had an exhibition a few years back um, where yeah celebrated um, as sort of a local um, artist in many ways. Yeah, I'm theorizing, but I know like growing up in New York. This idea of kind of navigating between, because uh, it happens here too, although it's happening less in San Francisco, but this idea of, of growing up, like his, the, the girlfriend said they were, one of the things they had in common is they were both the children of immigrants. And I think that that idea and that, that, that sort of stance means that you kind of have a, a particular place in terms of your observation and you have all these things to choose from and you have probably facility to do that. I was going to ask you, you know, the Basquiat uh, estate. I think is reaping that they're sort of handling some of these sales and things. Is that correct? Is mm -hmm. that his father, or does his mother have anything to do with that? Do you know? It, it went to his father, it did. Okay, um, right. but the father died in oh, yeah, July. Oh, right. so now his two sisters are uh, in control of the estate. Right. Yeah. I'm interested uh, in your opinion on whether uh, a younger generation of artists find his work um, that speaks to them or they find inspiration from it uh, either for themselves as, say, an African American. I know I find it quite powerful and moving, but like a younger generation, do they, does it speak to them? Like give them encouragement to like say, yes, I can move on and create great work. Go ahead. Me? Yeah. Oh. So I can say that for the, the, the students that I've worked with in uh, mostly in New York more than in California, because I think he's simply just better known in New York than in California, but uh, they, I think they are initially alienated by the work because they're not sure how to read it. And they think it looks like all that other Enzo Cucci. I mean, he, you know, he just visually gets lumped with the 80s, which is for them now is kind of ancient history. And wh why, I know, <laughs> why, you know, why, you know, do we even, we don't even make, it, they don't want to make canvases anymore. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of youthful transitions out of traditional media and so forth. But for those people who are interested in painting and who are willing to just, pause and hear someone talk about what's happening in the work, then they actually get pretty inspired to think about process as well as sort of the layering effect of the work. And a lot of them get inspired linguistically too mm -hmm. by the work, mm -hmm. the way as you were talking about, just how these two different semiotic systems, language and the visual, can play off each other. And they might not repeat the work then formally, but they might take some of those ideas and push them a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and, and not be afraid to, to think about that as a kind of material to play with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I would have to agree, and I think it's not just, you know, one thing is striking to me is is, you know, it's not just 
young painters, but young musicians, young poets, right? That's kind of find these different points of entry right. into the work that's really fascinating. Um, and I think, you know, he's just become this sort of pop culture icon, right? I mean, you can buy t-shirts, right, with his works on them at Uniqlo. Um, so I think that, you know, his, his, I, he always has this kind of double life, right? As sort of this, this serious artist, but then also sort of this, he's become this product, right? This commercial product in a very sort of um, obvious way, right? Swatch watches and like Reeboks and, yeah. And I think that in, in many ways, he sort of carries forward that tradition um, of Warhol. And I think one thing that has not yet been really discussed or analyzed is that, yes, he's taking appropriation and yes, he's doing these things, but I think one way that he does sort of align with Bearden is that he actually is not just copying other artists, he begins to copy his copies of other artists, right? And so copying himself, I think, is a really interesting sort of take um, that he begins, it's a path that he goes down um, in a way that, you know, is in, that certainly has connections to what Bearden's doing with photostats. Um, of his own work, um, but really come into play quite clearly with his use of Xerox um, in the 80s and sort of the abilities of the technology to quickly reproduce in a way that Rauschenberg could not have done or Warhol could not have done with silkscreen. So. Um, I wanted to ask, I have to write it down. <laughs> um, but just thinking about the word, this is the phrase black artist in the the black being a qualifier and also a commodifier, and specifically in how that's relating to contemporary art and artists working right now, how artists are dealing with that dichotomy and, and how that relates to Basquiat and how that is, is being dealt with now. Million dollar question. I know, you can definitely speak to yeah. that. You speak to that too. <laughs> um, it's a big question. So coming back to that comment that Basquiat made, you know, what do you think about being called the black Picasso? And he said, you know, I think it's kind of insulting, right? Like, in other words, why, why do you need the black as the qualifier, right? Why, do, why does it have to be seen that way? Why can't you just look at the work, right? So there is that, and there, and there is a, um, and when the freestyle show came out, it had a lot of play in New York a number of years ago with the term post-black that emerged, which I think that Thelma Golden um, and her collaborators on this show were really interested in just doing something critical and creative and um, almost playful with that term, but I think it got taken up in ways that they didn't really anticipate it would get taken up. And I think it got also taken up by, um, and I'm being cynical again, but I've been around for a while, it got taken up by a white art world that was really happy about the idea. <laughs> that, done. Yeah, they, yeah, we're not gonna have to deal anymore <laughs> with racial difference mm -hmm. because now it's po now we're all post now we're all post black and, and post whatever and just loved it right okay so there's this there's a there's this there's a way in which an effort to critically engage the way labels constrain and constrict can occasionally serve the interests of others that would prefer not to even address cultural difference or racial difference or racial history so i think where we are now is a really interesting moment where artists are trying to think about how do I make my work be about what it is about? And in some cases, the artist happens to identify as black and happens to make work about that issue or about blackness. And other artists who identify as black would like to make work that's not about blackness or has nothing to do with those issues and would really prefer not to have to always be anchored mm -hmm. to their identity when they're just interested in talking about something else in their work, like abstraction. And so I would say there's a constant tension right now, even in scholarship and criticism, about how do you address the work. And my advice to young critics, for example, is always look at the work. You know, what is the work doing? Uh, what is happening in the artwork? Don't assume that you can make uh, summary judgments based on either how the artist identifies or what the artist looks like. Mm -hmm. The artist is doing work about race or the history of race in the United States, like some of the artists I write about, then it's about that. If, if the artists are not working on them, and maybe that's not what the work is about. And that doesn't have to be a primary focus of your analysis or criticism. Mm -hmm. I was going to say the one thing I, what I'm waiting for is the time when we can have a conversation about that. Because right now, even that whole idea of whether are you identifying black or not raises so much heat that it can't even be talked about in a rational way, which I think is really unfortunate. Because I think 
it, it, it's there, it's reality, and I think it would be nice to be in a situation, and, and I think it really has to do with who has control of the loudspeaker, who has a, you know, that if the, the sort of people that are kind of um, either allowing a particular stance to be repeated, there's, that, that's in the control of certain people, and that has a lot of influence. It's like some people are threatened by that because of the history of the fact that if that was denied at a certain time, you know, not too long from now, it, it sort of denied you being either to get your work out or to even exist as a, you know, as a human being. And so I think the fact that, um, I won't, well, I, I, Kara Walker is a, a primary example of that. Someone who is a, a, of a certain generation and she was criticized by people of her parents' generation because she was really going deeper in terms of that issue and even how he was, was addressing the idea of race. Um, and unfortunately, the conversation was mainly about um, criticizing her rather than talking about the work. And I, I, I mean, I think, you know, we should be able to talk like adults, but I think that that sort of got in the way of really addressing that issue. And uh, I think it's less, and I think as, um, I think j sort of subsequent generations can still sort of decide and address idea, ideas of identity and, and in their work. But I think we're in a place where maybe it can be, you know, you can have a choice and you can have a choice to do it really intelligently and with integrity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'll just say like, I'm closing because I think we're out of time, you know. I, I think, you know, to answer your question, I think what's interesting to me is not whether or not Basquiat is black or not black. Right. That's something I talk about in the book, but really the fact that his work reveals our tendencies to identify certain formal qualities of his work as white, right? It's his technique as white, and his sort of concern with social justice as black, right? And that's really an interesting thing. And so I'm, you know, in the, in the book, really trying to complicate that binary, right? That he's only white in terms of his formal qualities, and he's only black in terms of his social qualities, mm -hmm. right? Because I do think that there's a lot of complication happening there. He's using aesthetic strategies and languages from right, Africa, mm -hmm. right, and from yeah. the diaspora, yeah. right? Um, and he's also doing sort of what we consider to be sort of white subject matter, right? He's dealing with issues of capitalism mm -hmm. in particular, right, and the market, right, and, and sort of all of this sort of commodification and appropriation of this legacy, right? Um, he's taken from European art history and complicating it and making it black, right, and maybe not so white. So I think that this really, you know, one of the main reasons I call it about ambivalence in American art is because I think it's, you know, it's never one or the other. You know, it's always kind of both and. It's like right. the band Gray. Like the band Gray, yeah, yeah perfect, thank you. I should have named it Gray. <laughs> now, now you tell me. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.